Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes topical questions. And we will now move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is a statement by Jenny Ruth on literacy and numeracy. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement and therefore there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Cabinet Secretary Jenny Ruth. Up to 10 minutes, please. Presiding officer, I welcome the opportunity today to update Parliament on a range of evidence concerning the performance of Scottish education. Today sees the publication of the Achievement of Curriculum for Excellence Levels, commonly known as ASIL, for the last academic year, 22-23. ASIL reports on the proportion of all pupils in Primary 1, Primary 4, Primary 7 and S3 who have achieved the expected Curriculum for Excellence Levels in Literacy and Numeracy. It is the most comprehensive national data set on attainment and literacy and numeracy, and it is predicated on teacher judgment. The proportion of primary pupils attending the, uh, attaining rather the expected levels in both literacy and numeracy have increased. This is the case for children from both the most and the least deprived areas. The attainment gap in literacy in primary schools has decreased. And at secondary level, we have seen increases in attainment across the board, whilst the attainment gap reduces. It is further worth remembering that this summer saw the overall pass rate for National 5 hires and advanced hires above pre-pandemic levels since 2019 and the poverty-related attainment gap narrowing. I hope that everyone in this chamber will welcome these achievements of our pupils, their teachers and our support staff. Nonetheless, presiding officer, I do not shy from the challenge presented by the OECD's post-COVID edition of PISA. It is an international sample survey which Scotland participates in. It measures 15-year-olds' ability to use their reading, mathematics and science knowledge to meet real-life challenges. But it is not a data set which should be read in isolation. To understand the accurate picture across our education system, we have to fully consider a range of different factors. Today, the Government has published the annual pupil, staff and ELC census, which provides a wealth of information, including teacher numbers, pupil-teacher ratios, the number of young people reported as having an additional support need and attendance and exclusion rates. Now, taken in the round, this evidence shows that the pandemic has had a profound impact on the attendance and achievement of Scotland's young people. But I want to be clear with Parliament that this trajectory, be that on attendance, on behaviour or on PISA, is not one that this government accepts. So we must commit to real terms improvements in Scotland's education system for our young people, for their parents and for the future of this country. Education can only improve the life chances of young people who are supported and encouraged by their parents or carers to attend. And since being appointed as Cabinet Secretary, I've expressed my concerns about the ongoing impact of the pandemic in our classrooms. Figures published today show that our attendance rate sits at 90.2% in 22-23, a decrease from 92% last year. Across the country, some councils have higher absence rates than others. Further, there is variation in certain year groups. Anecdotal evidence of unrecorded absence from class continues to suggest that while some pupils might be attending school, they are not necessarily present in class. That is not good enough. Education Scotland, at my request, has undertaken work to better understand the current barriers and the challenges experienced by our schools, children and young people, and their families, which influence on school attendance and behaviour and their report, Improving Attendance and Understanding the Issues, published at the end of last month. Building on that work, I have tasked the Interim Chief Executive of Education Scotland, Gillian Hamilton, to work directly with Directors of Education to drive improvements on attendance as a matter of priority. This will require local authority leadership. Presiding Officer, the role of Scotland's dedicated teachers is critical to improving our education system. And whilst the pupil-teacher ratio remains the lowest in the UK, at 13.2, Figures published today show a fall in teacher numbers by 0.3%. And although that is a small change, Parliament will recall that the Scottish Government made an additional ring-fenced investment of £145 million to protect teacher numbers. It is therefore extremely disappointing that a number of local authorities did not choose to use the additional funding to protect their teacher numbers. Conversely, I know some local authorities went above and beyond to protect their teacher numbers. I thank them for that and for investing in better outcomes for their young people. We've written today to each of the local authorities where the numbers of teachers has reduced to seek an explanation and I will meet with COSLA on this matter later this week. And whilst the government will of course consider these reductions on a case-by-case -case basis, I will continue 
to reserve the right to withhold funding allocated to protect teacher numbers where that has not been the case. Fundamentally, we cannot hope to improve attendance, behaviour or attainment with fewer teachers in our schools. Presiding officer, one issue raised by PISA, and in recent BISA research, I should say, has been pupils' use of mobile phones. And as Cabinet Secretary, I cannot unilaterally ban mobile phones. That power, of course, rests with head teachers and our local authorities. But I want to examine all the evidence on this and encourage schools to take the action they deem necessary. So we will work to provide refreshed guidance to schools on the use of mobile phones in schools as part of that joint action plan to respond to the BISA research. This will take a range of factors into account, including considering pupils' personal circumstances, particularly, of course, those of young carers. But our starting position is that head teachers are empowered to take the steps that they consider appropriate. And if they see fit, the guidance will support the use of banning mobile phones in schools. Presiding officer, I want to turn now to reflecting directly on Scotland's PISA results. Now, in absolute terms, it is true that Scotland mirrored the overall international trend of a reduction in PISA scores in reading and maths between 2018 and 2022. We are not unique in that respect. And as has been noted, the OECD have referred to this year's results as the COVID edition. COVID impacted and it continues to impact on educational outcomes. Whether in Wales, Northern Ireland or England for maths and reading, the trajectory on scores is a downward one. And across the OECD, as was the case in 2018, Scotland is above the average for reading and similar to the OECD average in relation to maths and science. So the challenge to government is this. Is average good enough? Presiding officer, I don't think so. Whilst it is true to say that PISA provides only a snapshot of the data, the results should serve as a wake up to all governments. And I hope Parliament hears the gravity with which I'm considering these results. The new post-COVID norm cannot be allowed to define the educational outcomes of the next generation. Now, building on my direct engagement with the OECD last month, next year I will meet with the OEC's Director for Education and Skills, Andrea Schleger, to ensure Scotland continues to learn from other countries and starts to improve her international standing on education once more. And it is worth reminding the Chamber that Curriculum for Excellence was endorsed by the OECD in 2021 as the right approach for Scottish education. However, I recognise the need to improve our curriculum in a planned and systematic way as has been recommended by the OECD. We need to do so to ensure it remains relevant, forward-looking, and ultimately supports high-quality teaching and learning. That is why next year we will begin a curriculum improvement cycle. This will include curriculum content, the role of knowledge, transitions between primary and secondary, and alignment between the broad general education and the senior phase. Presiding officer, my view is that mass education requires to be a central focus for improvement. Indeed, it is critical when considering the 18-point reduction in Scotland's PISA score. Maths will therefore be the first curricular area to be revised. And I want this work nationally to be led by a maths specialist, working alongside our national response to improving mathematics. That specialist will have a key role in the full-scale update to the maths curriculum, which will begin in 2024 and be tested with Scotland's teachers later next year. They will provide a key role in driving the improvements required learning from the outputs from PISA and a range of other evidence sources to improve Scotland's performance in maths. Further, to support the implementation of our new maths curriculum, the Interim Chief Inspector has agreed that a maths national thematic inspection with a focus on teaching and learning will be taken forward in 2024, reporting in next autumn. And finally, the Council of Deans will convene their initial teacher education group on maths education. That group will ensure that initial teacher education aligns with the latest developments in maths and numeracy. Presiding officer on English and literacy, the national response to improving literacy is taking forward work in terms of identifying priorities for improvement. I've also asked the interim chief inspector to begin a thematic inspection of literacy and English nationally to help inform the required update and to improve the literacy and English curriculum. Literacy and English will flow as the next priority for curriculum update following maths. Children's speech, language and communication has also been an area particularly affected since the onset of the COVID pandemic. And the government has invested in a new team of speech and language specialists with a clear focus on supporting preventative work on speech and language development in the early years. The curriculum update will therefore require to embed learning on speech and language in reviewing our curriculum content to better ensure progression and drive improvement. As Lucy Crean has noted, the history of PISA can be traced back to an American president back in the 1980s who was keen to drive national educational improvement. 
yet he was faced by resistance by state-level governments. That's not, thankfully, the case in Scotland. Here, our Council's collective ambition to raise absolute attainment and li in literacy and numeracy and narrow the attainment gap are reflected in their new three-year stretch aims for progress by 25-26, which also published today. And if those stretch aims are realised compared to 2016-17, we would see overall attainment in literacy and numeracy increased by around 13 and 9% respectively, and the poverty-related attainment gap narrowing in literacy and numeracy by around 30% over the lifetime of the Scottish Attainment Challenge. I'm very grateful to COSLA for the progress thus far, and I commit to working with our councils in the spirit of Verity House to drive the improvements we need to see. Presiding officer, I recognise the experience of education has changed for our young people, their teachers and parents and carers. <coughs> COVID has had a profound impact on attendance, behaviour and achievement. But fundamentally, we need to disrupt the PISA trajectory and drive improvements across school education. That will also be informed by working with our International Council of Education Advisors and working with COSLA, national agencies and professional associations. To that end, the next steps I set out today are part of the solution, but they are not the whole picture. Because I agree that a knee-jerk political response is not going to help our young people. I believe that Scotland is at an educational juncture. Perhaps radical reform to our qualification system is the answer. Some argue persuasively that is the case, and I look forward to returning in the Chamber in the new year to debate those proposals more fully. But others point to the need for improvement versus radical reform, recognising the extraordinary pressures our teachers are working under. Working with them to plot a pragmatic route forward might just be the way. Presiding officer. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in her statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for that, after which we will move on to the next item of business. And it would be helpful if those who would wish to seek to ask a question could press the request to speak buttons. And I call Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. And I welcome both her acknowledgement of the poor legacy of her predecessors, but also a recognition of the need for action. I also agree with her recognition that teacher numbers are concerning. And I therefore ask, despite the government's overuse of temporary teacher contracts, the forcing of councils to rely on probationers and failure to deal with the rural and non-central belt recruitment, she's reiterated her threat today to withhold money from the 17 councils who haven't increased teacher numbers. Can I ask, what is her thinking behind this threat, as that uncertainty over funding isn't going to help improve matters? Secondly, there's been a 25% increase in pupils with ASN to uh, since 2008 to 34% in 2022, yet a decline of 700 SFL teachers. So what precisely is the Cabinet Secretary doing to increase the ASN teacher numbers? And finally, whilst there was a welcome rise in PSAs between 2018 and 22, that was done using additional COVID funding. What's the Cabinet Secretary going to do to address the consequences of ending that funding on PSA numbers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank the member for his question. He touches on a, a number of points and I welcome the uh, tone with which he has responded to my statement. I think it's really important that we learn from the plethora of different data sets that we've published today, but also the PISA data that we've published, or published obviously last week, to help support the improvements we need to see. We need to be pragmatic because the ASIL data tells us a bit of a different picture to the PISA outcomes, and it's predicated on teacher judgment. And I do trust Scotland's teachers to tell us where our young people are in terms of their progress. That being said, he, he raises uh, issues in relation to teacher numbers. And of course, um, the point I was making in my statement is that the government has provided additionality for these additional teachers within the system. A number of our local authorities have not delivered on that additionality. It was ring-fenced for a reason, but as I've set out previously, we will listen to any mitigating circumstances that local authorities want to provide. We have written this afternoon to local authorities directly to hear what those concerns might be, and I expect to hear from them at the start of next week. Uh, more broadly, he touched on teacher contracts. And of course, I think in exchanges in the chamber recently, I've set out the approach I've taken working with the Strategic Board for Teacher Education. I met with uh, his colleague, Alexander Burnett, who's not in the chamber today last week to talk about some of the challenges that he faces in that area of Scotland. And I recognise there are rural challenges and there are particular subject challenges too. And I think we need to make sure the system better meets the needs of our rural areas. It is worth saying, of course, the government provides the preference waiver scheme, from which I benefited myself some years ago now to help incentivise our probationers going to other parts of the country. But what we have seen, anecdotally I should say, since the pandemic, is that our probationers, or those in their student year currently, are less likely to tick the box than they might have been prior to the pandemic. 
And I think we need to look again at that system and whether or not it's working to help ensure that we are seeing a spread of probationers to uh, more rural parts of Scotland and in different subject areas too. He talked about the challenge in relation to additional support needs which is one of the key findings from um, the data today. And actually, of course, we should be mindful that additional support needs will be higher in certain schools and lower in certain schools, depending on the cohort. I was in a school yesterday, for example, in East Lothian, where this cohort was much higher, at around about 47%. So it's not, uh, the, whilst, the accurate, whilst the national picture will give you a snapshot at around 40% at the current time, some schools will have higher need and some fewer. But the question I asked teachers in my visit yesterday was, do you think, therefore, that mainstream isn't working? And that wasn't their response. They think mainstream is working, and we need to look again at how we can resource that need and support it. It is worthwhile saying that we do have a record number of additional support needs, uh, learning support assistance in our schools. Um, we have also supported that with £830 million in 2021-22. We have also ring-fenced additional funding uh, for £15 million every year to respond to the individual needs of children and young people. And also that helps to support maintaining our record levels of investment in those staff. But I think more broadly, in all that I've set out today, what is key to driving the improvements we need to see is that close working relationship with COSA. That's actually why I think Verity House is so important. We need to work with them to ensure that at a local level we don't see that variance in terms of the support that's provided. Thank you. What I would say is that we, we need to ensure that we get in as many members as I can, and therefore uh, I always appreciate succinct questions, but also Cabinet Secretary, I do appreciate succinct answers. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I want to thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. I also want to welcome the recognition of the gravity of the situation in schools and the need to disrupt the trend seen in PISA. We must do all we can to do this for the future of Scotland's young people. There are some announcements in today's statement, however, that we really need some more detail on to understand how they will affect the change needed, including on the curriculum improvement cycle and on the approach to maths. But where there is a real lack of detail or even mention, and it's already been mentioned um, in the previous question, is of children with additional support needs, despite their numbers increasing, and that fewer of them reach expected levels of literacy and numeracy than others. The solutions pointed to in the document that accompanies the statement are almost three years old and there's nothing specific in the statement for them. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, does she believe that the actions set out today are proportionate to meet the scale of the challenges before us, including for a, a children with additional support needs? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for her question. Uh, I thank the, the tone she too has adopted in relation to us working together on this, because I think there is a need now for us to work across parties on some of the challenge here. And I, she has my commitment today that I will continue to work with her to that end, and of course with Mr Kerr. Um, I think more broadly she talked about curriculum improvement. One of the things I was very keen to say in my statement today, given there are a wide range of data sets that we're publishing today, is this isn't the whole picture. This will be part of the response, but we will work with our teaching profession to help drive the improvements we need to see, particularly on maths education. I'm very keen to work with our maths teachers. That's why I want to appoint a subject specialist with the necessary skills and qualifications who will help to give me the advice on where we need to see improvement and how that can be driven forward. I'm not a maths specialist to trade. I don't pretend to have those qualifications, but I do think it's important that we recognise, particularly in our secondary schools, the qualifications of those who deliver our subjects and actually their investment in their subject and their knowledge will help to, I think, put us in the right trajectory in terms of PISA. But PISA is part of the, the story and it is survey data, so we need to be careful about making direct comparisons. Um, I think more broadly, and that's why actually the ASL data has been helpful today, because of course, in my response to Mr Kerr, I, I suggested, I, I touched on the point that it is predicated on teacher judgment. Presiding officer, I'm conscious of time. I have not had time to respond fully to Ms Duncan Glancy's ask on additional support needs, but she is right, there is a challenge here. I have intimated in my response to Mr Kerr the government support that we provide, but I do think we will need to look again. Part of that work is through the national action plan that we have already with local government. We are working through a number of those actions. Um, they are not yet, to my mind, uh, fully supported in the way that I would like to see them. However, we will continue to work with local authorities and protect that budget line too, which I think is vitally important to ensuring that we have that consistency at local authority level. But she has my word that this is not the end of the story in terms of our response to PISA and the other challenges that we've touched on today. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. President officer, we have had two questions and it's nearly seven and a half minutes. Is there any possibility that we can expand, expand the time allocated to questions in response to this statement so that all members who wish to ask questions can have the privilege of doing so on the basis that we will all be succinct? 
I, I thank Mr Kerr for his uh, contribution. What I can assure Mr Kerr of is that we do have a bit of time in hand this afternoon and I am conscious of that and I also would make a further plea to the Cabinet Secretary, hopefully that is being listened to by the front bench, uh, that we need, do need uh, briefer responses in order to ensure that members, backbenchers, have the opportunity to put their questions to the Cabinet Secretary. And with that, I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Ros McCall. Thank you, Presiding Officer. University of Melbourne study, The Effect of Classroom Environment on Literacy Development, found that noise levels are significantly higher in open plan classrooms, increasing by an average of 5.4 decibels compared with enclosed classrooms, leading to a decline in classroom speech intelligibility of 10 to 15 per cent. Meanwhile, the reading fluency of primary school pupils in open plan classrooms was half that of pupils taught in enclosed classrooms. Given these stark findings, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that it is time that local authorities began working towards the removal of open plan classrooms, which should quickly improve attainment, not least among sensitive and neurodivergent children? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I thank the member for asking that question. I think he raises a very important point. Of course, the design of our classrooms, and particularly the design of our schools, is a matter for local authorities. I have never, as myself, previously taught in a, an open plan classroom. I imagine there are a number of challenges that come with that. I have visited a number of schools, though, particularly in primary settings, where it seems to work well. But it has to be a decision, I think, for local authorities working with their teachers to help inform the type of learning and teaching they see. But I think the member raises some important points today in relation to how that can interact, particularly with need in the system where there might be a need for uh, quiet areas, for example, in the delivery of learning and teaching. Uh, Ros McCall to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I note the Cabinet Secretary's recognition that average is not good enough in maths and reading and that PISA is not a data set that should be taken in isolation. Given that Scot the Scottish Government previously announced its intention to re-enter Scotland into Tim's and Pearl's International League tables, and given that the last available data for Scotland comes in 2006 and the next cycle will be 2026, what international data does the Cabinet Secretary excuse me, suggest we use to measure success in the interim? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for her question. She's right to touch on Tims and Pearls, which of course we will be rejoining. I have queried with officials whether or not we could um, look to expedite her rejoining of those surveys. It's not possible to do so. So at the current time, I don't have an answer to the member to that point. But it is worthwhile saying uh, in absolute terms that Scotland mirrored the overall international trend in terms of a reduction in PISA scores. But it's also worth the caveating that and saying that we have maintained our position on that important international study. I actually think there's lots of work we can learn from other countries. That's why I'm engaging very closely on the OECD on this matter, but also with our Council of International Education Advisors. I touched on that in my summing up, presiding officer, and I think they will help to support us in driving the uh, improvements we need to see in the interim period. I call Ruth McGuire to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Presiding officer, this year's Book Bug Read Write Count campaigns encourage a lifelong passion for learning from the very crucial early years. How will the Scottish Government ensure that parents and guardians are supported to make the most of these early years programmes so that more families can experience the transformative benefits of playing, reading, writing and counting together? Cabinet Secretary. I absolutely agree that parents and families play a really crucial role in supporting our children's speech and language development in those early years and they continue to play that role throughout uh, as the primary educators of their children. But we know that parental engagement has a significant positive impact on children's achievements. And actually some of the challenging data from PISA is that that has been disrupted during the pandemic. Our book bug read, write, count with the First Minister programmes help to encourage an early love of books among our children, while also giving opportunities for our parents and carers with their wee ones to spend time together having fun and learning. And some families, of course, need additional support to make the best use of those programmes. That's why it's really important to see broader activity, such as the Book Trust Book Bug for the Home Initiative, supporting families to share songs, rhymes and stories. I call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Michelle Thompson. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that last week's First Minister's questions centred around the PISA results. And at that, the First Minister assured us that the Scottish Government, quote, we will reflect on that and consider the results and come forward next week with more detail on the action that we will take. Many of the questions so far have sought more detail. 
Is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied with the level of detail she's been able to share in this statement? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for his question. He will appreciate I've had a 10-minute statement to Parliament reflecting on a range of different data sets. But I'm more than happy to come back to Parliament with a fuller update in relation to that detail that he's asked for. I've set out a number of actions I hope you will understand in relation to action we will be taking. Yes, working with, uh, with Education Scotland, but also reviewing our curriculum. I think that's where we need to get to in terms of driving the improvements. Mathematics has to be first, I think, given the, the PISA results. There is a challenge there, and I think we need to reflect on that. We're only going to get to the improvements we need to see by working with Scotland's teachers. That's why they have to be key to understanding the challenge and driving the improvements we need to see, whilst also engaging with the point I think that Rose McCall quite rightly makes, international experts and the international evidence that's available to drive that improvement too. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Willie Rennie. Can the Cabinet uh, Secretary advise what attention is being given to the qualitative commentary within the PISA report, which gives a much more nuanced understanding than the simple raw statistical data? Cabinet Secretary. I think the member makes a very important uh, point. The questionnaire evidence and the analysis across countries conducted by the OECD are really important aspects to also consider. So the wider analysis looks at a much more complex picture and in many respects a much more comprehensive picture. So, for example, the PISA student questionnaire picture, uh, for ex uh, sorry, the PISA student questionnaire asks students about their experiences of learning mathematics in schools, their views on maths in general, and their future intentions to study and use maths later in life. That data, alongside data on student backgrounds, will be further analysed and used to give us a much more rounded understanding of the experiences of learning mathematics and what factors help to support learning in schools. But that's why it's so important to reflect on and share that wider analysis with local authorities and schools, and actually with Parliament too, presiding officer. I call Willie Rennie to be followed by John Mason. Uh, we need to remember the context of this. We were promised back in 2016 significant improvements in the performance on education and the poverty-related attainment gap. In that context, these ASO numbers have hardly budged at all. And I'm really disappointed that the Education Secretary is only the only ambition now is to close the poverty-related detainment gap by a third by the end of this parliament when it was supposed to close absolutely completely. But do I detect a fundamental change of direction on curriculum for excellence towards knowledge and away from skills? Cabinet Secretary. Thank the member for his question. Um, I'm not sure if he was aware there was a global pandemic between now and 2016. I think that has impacted on outcomes. Well, I'm sorry, I hear a sedentary mumbles from the opposition, but I have to say the OECD describes... Cabinet Secretary, please resume your seat for a second. Could I please ask members to listen to the person who has the floor? In the instant case, it is the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, please resume. It was, of course, the OECD that called this data set their COVID edition. Not uh, that setting that aside. I think we do need to be mindful in the context of Mr Rennie's point that this year we have seen overall pass rates for National 5 hires and advanced hires above those pre-pandemic in 2019. And the poverty-related attainment gap has narrowed. The 22-23 ASIL data, which is published today, confirms that the proportions of primary school children from the most deprived areas of Scotland achieving the expected curriculum for excellence levels in literacy and numeracy are both at record highs. That is welcome news in the context of the pandemic, which disrupted our children's education for the best part of two years. However, the member asked a supplementary question in relation to the role of skills and knowledge in our curriculum. And as I intimated in my update, presiding officer, that is something we will consider through the curriculum review, starting, of course, with mathematics education, recognising the challenge there. I call John Mason to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Thank you. A teacher said to me the other day that they wondered if in primary schools we're trying to cover too many subjects, and there certainly are more than when I was at primary school. How would the Cabinet Secretary respond to that? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's important that all children in primary school experience a broad and a balanced education to help them make sense of the world. That means, of course, experiencing learning right across all eight curriculum areas, as they are currently, which includes literacy, numeracy, as well as opportunities for interdisciplinary learning. But, as I uh, outlined in my response to Mr Rennie, we are soon to embark on a curriculum improvement cycle. That, I think, will help to clarify and strengthen a shared understanding of practice from 3 to 18 in each of our curriculum areas. I call Julie Mackay to be followed by Sue Webber. COVID-19 undeniably exacerbated the challenges facing the Scottish education system and others across the world, but most of these challenges existed before 2020. The Scottish Government's package of education reform, including replacing the SQA and bringing our qualifications and assessment system out of the Victorian era, aren't the whole solution, but they are critical to improving outcomes. 
International comparisons are far from the most important, important measurement of success, but as today's welcome news on ASIL data suggests, they do matter. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how these reforms are expected to contribute towards improving Scotland's PISA scores? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the member raises a very important issue because reform of our national agencies is a really vital part of our work in relation to improving Scotland's approach and our support for education and skills. So reform is essential if we're going to address some of the challenge, the changing needs of our education system now and into the future. The design of these new bodies uh, are therefore an opportunity, I think, to deliver the needed change in practice and culture um, to help support improved outcomes, but also to support the teaching profession uh, in terms of how they work, as well as strengthening their roles as organisations within the system as a whole. So reform of our qualifications and assessment system will absolutely be a central part of that wider reform agenda, and it will require to help address the challenge that PISA presents the government with. I call Sue Webbers, followed by Stephen Kerr. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Evidence shows there is a clear link between mobile phone use and poor behaviour in schools. New guidance on mobile phone use in schools has already been introduced south of the border. The Cabinet Secretary, you have stated today you cannot unilaterally ban mobile phones, but will work to provide refresh guidance to schools on the use of mobile phones. How long will it take to see decisive action on this? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for her question. I think she raised this at FMQs last week and I think as well in a, a recent parliamentary statement. And she knows my views on this, that um, where her teachers see fit, they should use that power at their disposal. I do not have a power as Cabinet Secretary to compel schools to enforce a national ban. However, I think it is a matter for teachers to work with their young people, with their parents, with their local community, and it will require them to buy into that process. But I know of a number of schools that we've discussed in the local area where bans are working quite successfully in practice. And there's also evidence to suggest from the United Nations earlier this year that excessive use of digital devices in schools can actually detract from the quality of learning and teaching. And we need to be mindful of that mix between traditional and more modern approaches to learning and teaching. She asked for a time frame. I do not have one in front of me at the current time. However, I'm happy to write to the member and update Parliament on that point, presiding officer. We will look to refresh the current guidance that we have, which is not prescriptive on this issue, but I will make sure that the national guidance in the future is prescriptive in giving that option to head teachers so that they are empowered to do so if they choose. And I call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Kerr. I'm going to give the Cabinet Secretary another chance to properly address the question that Willie Rennie raised because I couldn't help but notice in the way she described the curriculum improvement cycle she gave a particular emphasis to the word knowledge and I'd like to give her the opportunity to restate her position in relation to the OECD report in 2021, which called on arrest for a restoration of, of, of knowledge. Now, she mentions um, clear guidance on, on mobile phones, which I think we, many of us would agree with. How about some clear guidance on behaviour standards, boundaries, the consequences of misbehaviour, uh, 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 exclusions, and on the presumption of mainstreaming. All of these areas require clear guidance from the Cabinet Secretary as well. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the member, I think, asked two questions, presiding officer. So briefly, um, it's not true to say that Curriculum for Excellence ignores knowledge, but we do need to improve the way that knowledge is covered in our curriculum. That's why the place of knowledge is a priority for our systematic improvement cycle that I uh, responded to Mr Rennie on. I have to query whether or not the Conservatives are now moving away from their support of Curriculum for Excellence. I hope that's not the case. The member asked a question in relation to behaviour. Of course, I set out in the Chamber a number of weeks ago now the response presiding officer to the behaviour in Scotland school research and the commitment to a national action plan that will give the detail the member seeks. And I call Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what actions and investment is being put in place to support learners with additional needs, such as dyslexia, to have better access to digital technology to improve literacy and how this teaching can be made more inclusive within the overall curriculum? Cabinet Secretary. Um, the member raises a really important point. We've heard from a number versus this afternoon, presiding officer, about the increase in young people with additional support needs. And the government is absolutely committed to improving the experience of those children, including those with dyslexia. And we are working closely with a number of partners to promote the use of our Addressing Dyslexia Toolkit, which includes advice to school staff on supporting children and young people's literacy through the use of digital technology. The government also funds Call Scotland to provide advice and training to school staff on support including on the use of assistive technology for children and young people with specific communication needs. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the statement. And we will now move on after a short pause to the next item of business. And frontbench teams should change position now, should they so wish. Thank you.